Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank uh, ANZICS for the opportunity to come visit Melbourne again, uh, my second home, and speak to you about some work that we're doing in Canada right now on the frail, critically ill patient. What I'd like to do maybe over the next 20 minutes or so is just give you a brief description of what frailty is, describe in brevity some of the methods that we use to clinically uh, uh, ascertain whether a patient may or may not be frail, and then I'll describe the results, uh, some of the ongoing results we have of a study looking at frailty and critical illness in terms of um, patient-centered outcomes. So what is frailty? I think conceptually it's difficult for us to understand what frailty may in fact be. But I think all of us would be at the bedside of a patient at some point, and often we've used the word frail to describe what they may be, but we've really not operationalized that. So we really don't have an objective measure for what that may be. And frailty is defined as this multidimensional syndrome that's related to aging, highly correlated with aging, uh, and often was initially described in, in elderly patients that's characterized by this loss of physiologic or cognitive reserves and results in the accumulation of deficits. Many of these deficits may be quite trivial, uh, but the challenge for these patients is that uh, individually, one or two deficits, they may in fact be treatable or reversible, but when they start to accumulate, the burden of disease for patients becomes somewhat insurmountable. And the challenge for them is that it then predisposes them to adverse events, adverse outcomes. So this is a nice diagram that tries to describe maybe some of the mechanisms that predispose to a frail, uh, frailty in a patient. Not only that, but these, these mechanisms, you know, follow this positive feedback loop. So we've heard elements of this already. You know, alterations to metabolic rate, uh, alterations to energy expenditures, uh, chronic undernutrition. And we've heard a little bit about, you know, muscle, obviously for a lot from Zinn about muscle, but sarcopenia is probably one of the pathophysiologic mechanisms predisposing to a frail state. It's interesting because some of these patients who are frail and they develop critical illness, they're going to have sarcopenia at the time of entry into the ICU. Uh, some will not, um, but what happens with critical illness, and I think Zudin's shown, illustrated quite nicely, is that patients do lose muscle mass, and they newly acquire sarcopenia as a consequence of their critical illness. And what I'd ask them to do now is identify a frail patient who has sarcopenia as part of their, you know, uh, physiologic profile and see what happens to them, you know, six or 12 months downstream. But there's a lot of different mechanisms that may feed into this. So this is truly a syndrome. It's quite complex. And, and you're never going to have a pill that you can give a frail patient to make them better to some extent because of all these um, uh, these issues. I like to think of uh, frailty as potentially an avalanche, um, and this is not a term that I've coined, um, but you know these patients accumulate deficits, they have a loss of homeostatic reserve, uh, so they have this diminished repertoire. They can't respond to external stress uh, like you or, or otherwise healthy people might be able to, and it's this idea of physiologic reserve. We don't have a test at the bedside right now that we can administer to a patient that tells us what is their physiologic or cognitive reserve. We don't, we don't know how to measure that. Um, but this results in patients failing to withstand these you know, somewhat trivial external stresses, and it just decompensates them. And so this is one way to look at it here. It's a diagram. On the y-axis, you have physical function uh, or mental function, if you like. And on the uh, x-axis, you have time. And there's two lines here, a black line and a gray line. And the black line essentially represents somebody who is otherwise normal, suffers an external stress. Let's say it's a bit of trauma. It's a community acquired pneumonia. They're hospitalized. They, they come into the ICU. They obviously have a decrease in their function associated with that. It doesn't really cross that threshold of, you know, newly dependence. Uh, but because they have sufficient reserve, they get back to their baseline and they move forward. A frail patient would behave somewhat differently. So a frail patient would have a much larger loss of acute function, be it, you know, psychosocial or be it physical. Uh, and they would uh, pass below a level of de dependency to some extent. Uh, these patients uh, would take a lot longer to recover, and they might not, in fact, likely not, get back to their baseline level of function before, whatever that may have been. So these patients are not able to compensate or withstand the stress of whatever it was that brought them to the ICU. 
In terms of measuring frailty, uh, this is a nice systematic review. It basically overviews sort of the multiple domains that go into assessment of whether a patient's in a frail state or not. And it actually documents over 20 different instruments uh, and scoring systems that have been used in the literature to describe frailty. But you can see that this is clearly a syndrome. All these domains, nutritional status, physical activity, some of these are self-reported. Uh, mobility, energy, strength, uh, cognition, mood. And importantly, and I think it's something that needs to be emphasized, is the social support that some of these patients have. So frail patients often have diminished social supports. As a consequence of their frailty, uh, it's well described in older patients, they go through a period of social withdrawal, uh, and that can predispose to uh, a sort of a positive feedback loop with respect to their frailty in and of itself. There are basically two, you know, broad schools of thought on how to classify and categorize frailty. One is by Linda Freed and colleagues. Linda Freed is the current, I think, uh, chair of the School of Public Health at Columbia University. And using the cardiovascular health study and the secondary analysis, she proposed these five, crit five criteria that you could use to phenotypically describe frailty. Shrinking, decreased grip strength, self-reported exhaustion, slow walking speed, low physical activity. Many of these are self-reported. But if you had three or more of these, you would be classified as being frail. The alternative model is uh, one that's been put forward by Ken Rockwood at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Canada. And he really developed this idea of the cumulative deficit model. And this was a analysis taken from the Canadian Study for Health and Aging, in which they captured 92 variables in an, you know, an older cohort of patients. And these were a whole host of things. Symptom signs, you know, various lab values, disease states, disabilities, whatever. And they were all termed deficits. If they were present, you had a deficit. If they were absent, you did not. Um, and what he developed was this idea of a frailty index, right? So the total number of deficits divided by the total number of variables measured. Now, 92 is pretty exhaustive. That wouldn't be pragmatic to do in an intensive care unit setting. But subsequent studies have shown that you probably need around 35 to 45 variables to measure. Uh, and that um, the frailty index in and of itself behaves pretty similarly. Depending on, it's not dependent on what variables you measure per se. It can be it can be quite variable. But you know, patients who had a frailty index of 0.2 to 0.4 would be described as moderately frail. Greater than 0.4, severely frail. Uh, if you had 0.7 or higher, no one survives. No one survives in all the studies that have looked at frailty index to some extent. So this, this frailty index is nice because it, you know, it, it looks at the cumulative effects of all these deficits. And it gives you some idea about biologic gradation. So this has been looked at in clinical studies in acute care medicine to some extent. I'll just show you a little bit of data. Uh, Linda Fried and her colleagues looked at this uh, in a cohort of patients undergoing elective non-cardiac surgery. And they classified frailty based on her phenotypic description um, using her five criteria, non-frail, intermediate, or frail. And about 10% of patients undergoing surgery here were frail. And you can see the average ages were about the same, but this was largely dependent because I think the whole cohort was over 65. I think the striking things here are that the frail patients had a much higher risk of post-operative complications. And these complications weren't necessarily surgical-related complications, but these were things like delirium, prolonged stay, other, other issues like this that, that delayed their discharge from hospital or their appropriate transition. They had longer recoveries. They stayed in hospital longer. And one of the most striking findings of the study was that patients had a 20-fold higher odds for being subsequently institutionalized. And that's a pretty massive uh, a risk for these frail patients. So there's an argument to be made that some of these patients were perhaps barely compensating to begin with, and that their transition into institutionalized care was an appropriate transition of care to fulfill the needs that they needed based on their level of frailty. But that remains, that's a bit speculative on my part. Um, but cer you know, certainly this is a high, um, a high odds of being institutionalized. Now, Gregory Hirsch, who's also at Dalhousie, he's a cardiac surgeon, looked at this in a cardiac surgical population. This was a cardiac surgical database that they, you know, retrospectively interrogated. Their definition of frailty was a little bit different. They looked at any disabilities defined by, you know, um, uh, disability and activities of daily living by the CATS index, uh, or any needs for assist assistance with ambulation or a diagnosis of dementia. Uh, interestingly enough, thankfully it was a small cohort of patients who were demented getting cardiac surgery in Halifax, but nonetheless, 
If you look at this study here, those that were classified as frail, it's quite striking to see the post-operative care that they required. They were more likely to be transfused, more likely to be diagnosed with low cardiac output syndrome. They had a higher risk of sepsis. They had a higher risk of pneumonia. Their delirium rates were higher. They had higher um, rates of needing prolonged mechanical ventilation after surgery to, to presumably repair and recover. But similarly to the study that Linda Freed published, here you see that their in-hospital mortality and their long-term mortality, that was at 12 months, was higher. But look at the institutionalization, a 6.3-fold higher odds of being institutionalized after their surgery. So again, here you're talking about patients who, you know, cardiac surgery in general has a pretty low mortality, but these patients were coming from a level of support that probably wasn't suitable to them, and they were being transitioned after a major event like cardiac surgery as a modifier. We haven't really operationalized frailty in critical illness. There have been studies that have tried to look at surrogate measures, if you like, to try to get an understanding about whether frailty, and, and not terming it frailty then, uh, how that impacts clinical course and outcomes. This is a study done by a colleague of mine in Edmonton, Canada, named Wendy Sleagle. And this was a prospective population cohort of, of patients who were admitted to ICU with severe community-acquired pneumonia. And she looked at pre premorbid functional status in the week preceding admission. And patients were classified as being completely independent, limited mobility, so largely dependent on you know, a walker or something to help with ambulation, or completely dependent and largely bedridden for the majority of their day. And they looked at outcome. And I think this, re, you know, this probably re, you know, re, um, reaffirms our bias about some of these patients to some extent. But basically, mortality was only evident in those that were completely dependent. These patients had a you know, 5.3 higher hazards of death in the short term and longer long-term mortality. Not surprising. And you can see on the curves, that largely occurred in the first 30 days, that huge separation and survival. So this is probably a surrogate, if you like, for a frail state, it's probable that these patients who were dependent for their care uh, had some uh, element of frailty. Similarly, Matthew Baldwin uh, at Columbia University is very interested in frailty, and he has been um, working uh, on a number of different avenues to try to understand the interaction between frailty and critical illness. And he published this study, which was basically largely based on administrative claims for uh, Medicare data in patients greater than 65, looking at trying to derive and validate a six-month mortality prediction for those that ultimately survive ICU. And he didn't have a measure of frailty for this study, but he used some surrogates for either frailty or disability. So age, admission to or from a skilled nursing facility, and how long patients stayed in hospital. You can see some of his data here. Uh, and, you know, these are an older cohort of patients without question. Most of these patients were at home before uh, they came to ICU, but you can see that uh, less than half of them actually were discharged home after. And the, the patients who were discharged to a skilled nursing facility had much higher mortality. But when he looked at a multivariate model trying to, you know, trying to um, characterize those factors that were most associated with mortality at six months, after ICU among survivors, you know, a few things came out that were quite interesting. So older age, of course. Longer lengths of stay in hospital. Again, may, perhaps a surrogate for frailty in that you need a lot longer to recover from your illness. Uh, admitted to or discharged to, admitted from or discharged to a skilled nursing facility also seem to be independently predictive of six-month mortality. Uh, burden of comorbidities, prolonged mechanical ventilation, along with, you know, the need for tracheostomy seem to be predictive. And what's unique about this study is that he actually included a, a line on DNR status. So uh, this is something novel that we haven't seen put into a lot of studies to some extent, but patient preferences for escalation of support to be readmitted to the intensive care unit. You can see this was a powerful predictor of whether you'd be dead or alive at six months, as, we would, as you would expect. So what was interesting is that when you look at these surrogate parameters, if you like, of frailty, um, basically this represented the independent percent contributions to his overall model. These surrogate um, parameters represented about 35% of the model. So frailty, if you like, seems to be important to predict, you know, post-ICU survivorship issues like survival. So 
to be honest, you know, we in my institution, especially with one of my colleagues, Rob McDermott, we sort of on ward rounds one day asked ourselves this very question. What is frailty in the ICU? What does it mean? How do you measure it? Is it relevant? Should we do anything about it? Um, and really that was the sort of inspiration for a small pilot study that largely grew from that. Uh, so we've developed a bit of a program of research now developed uh, around understanding frailty and its interaction in critical illness. So our initial study was a prospective cohort study at two academic and four community hospitals in uh, Alberta, Canada. Um, we admitted, uh, we enrolled patients who were aged 50 years or older to the study and expected to survive at least 24 hours. And, and the 50 year cutoff, uh, some of my colleagues who were around 50 years of age were a little bit upset with me at the prospect of, you know, including them in this frailty study. And I said to them, well, the prevalence of frailty in the, in the population in general at age 50 is very, very low. Um, but, you know, something makes you susceptible to developing critical illness. And we believe and we hypothesized, and we're certainly work looking at this now, that, you know, frailty may be age shifted amongst those that develop critical illness. So we wanted to capture a younger cohort of patients to uh, determine what the prevalence was in them as well. All assessments occurred in the ICU after admission, so there was no triaging before admission, and that is one limitation we acknowledge of our study. All patients had, you know, detailed medical record reviews and interviews with the surrogate decision makers, and we assessed their exposure, which was frailty, using the clinical frailty scale score developed by Ken Rockwood and colleagues. We had it assessed independently both by uh, coordinators and by the treating clinicians as well, and we had pretty good correlation between uh, scores between the uh, almost 400 match pairs that we had. Um, our primary outcomes were death in hospital, and we looked at a number of secondary events like adverse events, uh, long-term mortality, rehospitalization rates, and quality of life. We used two instruments for quality of life. We used the SF12 and the EQ5D. So this is the clinical frailty scale. Some of you may or may not have seen this. Um, and what it is basically is, is uh, informed subjectivity about where patients would, would stand on this scale of one to eight, if you like. And this is a bit of a modification from Ken Rockwood's original publication, uh, modified by Ken Rockwood, to add an additional level of frailty to this. So patients who are one to three in this score would largely be, hopefully, like most of us here. Uh, four would be a patient who's a bit vulnerable. Five would be the threshold for frailty. And between five and eight, there's different gradations of frailty. And then nine is terminally ill. And we did not use this criteria in our study. But, you know, terminally ill patients may or may not be frail. So I think that's why it was acknowledged and recognized on this scale that they included that. We approached uh, close to 2,200 patients, um, of which, you know, 1,400 were potentially eligible, and ultimately we were able to enroll 421, of which all had uh, data available on vital status at 6 and 12 months after enrollment in the study. And what's interesting in our, in our at least in the cohort we enrolled in the, popu in, in the study, we found that about one-third of patients were indeed frail. Uh, they had a score of five or greater on the clinical frailty scale. And that's represented by green and blue here. What was also very fascinating to us is that full one-third of patients actually were characterized as being vulnerable. So you could make the argument that two-thirds of the population of critically ill patients here in our study were at least vulnerable or overtly frail. This is some of the baseline characteristics that I'll just draw your attention to. Frail patients were a bit older, but you can note that the age of our cohort was much younger than that reported in, older, in prior studies looking at frailty to some extent. Frail patients were uh, more likely to be female. Uh, and again, some of that social support I talked about earlier, they're more likely to be widowed. They were less likely to have completed higher levels of education. They had higher burdens of comorbidities, lots more prescription drugs. Fewer of them were um, surgical patients, so post-operative. Uh, and their Apache 2 scores are a little bit higher. So that's probably reflected in the comorbidities, probably more medical, et cetera. Here is some of the baseline sort of vocation disposition of these patients. So you can see by frailty, independent at home was much less likely for a frail patient than for a not frail patient. And if you look at the activities of daily living, you can see across every single one measured, the frail patients actually had a uh, lower proportion of, um, you know, they were less likely to be independent across all of these activities of daily living. Not only that, they were more likely to have been hospitalized in the preceding 12 months. Right? So we believe that we captured a cohort who we classified as frail that largely is representative of what frail would be in the you know, classic sense of older uh, uh, cohorts of patients that are ambulatory.
What's interesting is that we looked at treatment intensity and the resources used in the ICU. So as I said before, these patients, you know, we enrolled them once they got into the ICU. It wasn't a triaging study per se. Uh, but once patients got into the ICU, what we found was that, frail or not frail, they received therapy that was largely commiserate with their illness severity. They were equally as likely as not frail patients to get mechanically ventilated, put on vasopressors, renal replacement therapy, transfusions, et cetera. So once they got in, they got, you know, therapy commensurate with how sick they were. And, and that was quite interesting. When we look at their outcomes, um, what's interesting is frail patients had more adverse events. Um, not only that, we saw that death in ICU was about the same between frail and not frail. However, where there was starting to be clear separation was when patients left the intensive care unit. You can see the mortality uh, upon discharge from ICU was about twofold higher than it was in, in the ICU. So 32% versus 16, essentially. Frail patients stayed longer in the ICU. They stayed longer in the hospital. Uh, and if you look at the group that ultimately survived discharge to hospital, far fewer frail patients were home and independent and many more of them were newly disabled compared to patients who were not frail. They were also more likely to be hospitalized within the subsequent 12 months, though the rates were pretty high in both cohorts. Here you can see you know, a classic Kaplan-Meier survival curve stratified by clinical frailty scale scores. So one to three is represented by the red line. You can see four is represented by those who are vulnerable. Five is you know, mild frailty, and six to eight would be greater severities of frailty. And you can see there's a nice dose response gradient with risk of death over the subsequent 12 months associated with a worsening state of frailty. We also looked at this in adjusted hazards model, and I just focus you on model five, where we adjusted for the age and the sex and the baseline comorbidity on the severity case mix and the type of institution that they were admitted to, be it a community, uh, community uh, metropolitan hospital versus uh, an academic tertiary care hospital. And I think you can see the same biologic gradient again. A worsening degree of frailty was associated with an increased hazards of death through 12 months. Amongst survivors, we actually looked at their health-related quality of life at 6 and 12 months. Now, we don't have health-related qu quality of life anchored uh, at admission to ICU by circuit decision makers. So this is where patients landed at 6 and 12 months. In Alberta, we do have, uh, we've had a previous study that's looked at population norms for the SF12 and, EQ and e um, EQ5D. So we have population norms for comparison as well. Here you can see the EQ visual analog scale, where a score of zero would be a state of health worse than death, and 100 would be a perfect state of health. And you can see those in green are those that are frail, uh, versus red, which are not frail survivors, and then blue represents the normal population. And you can see clearly, I think, that frail patients at both 6 and 12 months surviving their episode of critical illness had lower health-related quality of life rated here than those that were not frail and certainly below the normal population. When you look at the SF12 mental component and physical component scores as well, you can see similar trends. So you can see that clearly at 6 and 12 months for the mental component scores, frail patients were a little bit worse. Certainly, even not frail patients were not near population norms by any means, um, but the frail patients were a little bit worse. And the phys physical component scores, at six months, you can see there's not much difference here between frail and not frail survivors. Um, but there was a little bit of separation by 12 months. So the, the patients who were not frail seemed to improve, and the patients who were frail uh, seemed to deteriorate a little bit. And both, again, were below the population norms. Here you can see the EQ uh, visual analog scale stratified by the clinical frailty scale score. And I think it's uh, interesting to note a couple of things here. One is if you had a score of 0 to 3, you're otherwise not frail and, and quite healthy. You can see at 6 and 12 months following survival from critical illness, your EQ uh, visual analog scale was approximately that of normal population. Now, with increasing degree of frailty, you can see that like a CSF 4 to 5 and 6 to 8, you can see that the EQ uh, visual analog scale scores get lower. So the more frail you were, the more you reported your health-related quality of life to be poor at 6 and 12 months. Finally, I think it's very interesting to note this as well. So in the EQ5D, there is a number of domains that they assess uh, whether patients are having problems. And they classify it as no problems, some problems, or extreme problems. Uh, and it looks at five domains, mobility, self-care, 
usual activities, pain, discomfort, anxiety, depression. Frailty at six months is represented by red. Frailty at 12 months is represented by orange. And the not frail patients are represented by the two blues. I think it's pretty striking to look at some of the, the reported uh, issues that these patients, specifically frail patients, were having at 6 and 12 months. So in terms of issues with mobility, you can see that three quarters of frail patients had issues with mobility. Self-care, uh, at least 50% had issues with self-care. Usual activities, very, very few patients who are frail were able to perform their usual activities even out to 12 months, right? 80% of patients reported problems in this. Um, the rates of pain and discomfort were bad for both frail frail and not frail, you can see that at least 50% of those not frail had some issues with this, but it was still significantly higher for frail patients. And worrisome as well is the issue around anxiety and depression. You can see that more than 50% of patients 12 months after survival from ICU had issues with anxiety and depression uh, if you were frail. So for some perspective, what I've done here is created a table where at the very bottom you can see two rows. You can see the ICU survivors in our study who are not frail and the frail ICU survivors. And these are basically their EQ visual analog scale scores. And what I've done is I've shown uh, you know, some reported EQ visual analog scale scores for some common chronic diseases like stroke, diabetes, heart failure, and stage kidney disease. And also some you know, health-related quality of life reported for common ICU syndromes such as uh, acute lung injury, ARDS, general critical illness survivors, sepsis or severe acute kidney injury supported by renal replacement therapy. And the striking thing I want to, to highlight is that the frail patients, the frail survivors, their scores were lower than all of these. Right? So I think you know, we are probably using this tool to identify a particularly vulnerable cohort of patients that if they survive, they're going to be struggling uh, with a, a number of different issues. So what are the implications in terms of the knowledge that, you know, maybe our study is starting to help uh, create? Well, it is possible that we could use an assessment of frailty as part of our routine assessment of patients who are being referred for critical care services. Uh, it could help inform the triage decisions uh, in terms of, you know, in terms of the suitability for patients for ICU admission. Uh, it could also perhaps better inform decision making once patients are in the ICU. And certainly the, regarding the scope of support and this idea of time limit of trials, um, certainly regarding the overarching goals of care and what may be feasible. Uh, and, in ter and importantly, in terms of the post-ICU survivorship experience, which we've heard a little bit of, about here already today. But, you know, informing patients and families about how their critical illness will impact their health-related quality of life at 6 and 12 months, the prospect of new disabilities, uh, the prospects of institutionalization, uh, and the need for ongoing health services. I think probably even, even more important than that, uh, or equally as important if you like, is the idea that we could use this knowledge about transitions of care. So if we're identifying a vulnerable cohort of patients because they're frail or vulnerable, uh, these patients may have specialized needs during rehabilitation. In particular, in times of transition when they go from a, you know, a pretty plush environment with lots of support and services like an intensive care unit to the ward which there is obviously a step down to some extent in the amount of support they get on the regular wards. And similarly, there may be an opportunity here for us to recognize specialized needs among some of our patients when they're looking to transition out of hospital. This is probably a time in, in, in a critically ill patient who survived their episode of criticalness. We, we don't interact with them that often. But we could probably set in play mechanisms to identify their specialized needs and hopefully uh, um, fulfill those. Finally, you know, recognizing the vulnerability of, of frail patients to some extent, we can look at potentially um, innovative interventions, if you like. And we've heard about some of them already, and Zidane, you know, talked about the exercise rehabilitation programs in ICU survivors, etc. But in the context of frailty, you know, we could maximize, focus on maximizing physical recovery, in particular, minimizing the disabilities, the high rates of disabilities that these patients acquire as a consequence of their critical illness. 
Importantly, though, and not to not to sort of overlook this, I think there needs to be a greater focus on the cognitive, psychosocial, and emotional recovery of some of these patients, given the high rates of anxiety and depression reported. And clearly, this is a bird. You know, there's a lot of literature that's starting to emerge emerge on this. You know, PTSD post and depression and anxiety that can linger for months or years after an episode of critical illness. And finally, there might be some role here for us to identify these patients who we anticipate are going to be a prolonged and complicated recovery. Um, to be able to focus on the caregiver burden that may be experienced um, um, by patients' families. So I, th I was thinking about frailty as a therapeutic target, and I think it's very challenging uh, because it is a syndrome. And we've, we've, we've been unfortunate that we've had very, a large number of neutral, is that the right term? Neutral trials amongst various ICU syndromes, lung injury, ARDS, sepsis, etc. But if you look at the literature, in terms of geriatric interventions for frail patients who are ambulatory in the geriatric setting. This is the sort of classification of domains that come out, right? Cognitive stimulation, exercise training, nutritional supplementation, pharmacologic agents, multimodal interventions, right, and home-based interventions. This is what's being done for frail patients in the community. So how do we translate that, perhaps, into an ICU setting? And here's some of the things that, you know, you could think about, right? You know, we are already starting to see some data about early awakening from sedation, uh, mechanisms to prevent delirium, cognitive stimulation. I don't know how many people uh, allow their patients to do sudokus and whatnot in the ICU. I mean, things like this, who knows? Um, exercise training. So early mobilization has certainly, um, certainly become a focus in the ICU in the last five years. And early targeted rehabilitation, in particular for some of these patients where they may have particular vulnerabilities. Nutritional supplementation, I'm not even going to open that box, but, you know, it's been discussed already. Pharmacologic agents, I think the harm that we probably cause is by giving too much to some extent. So minimizing or avoiding unnecessary medications to some extent may help facilitate that. And then, you know, occasionally I come on in the ICU and there's been long-stay patients and they have a testosterone patch and they're getting some Ritalin. I'm not really sure what the roles of those things are, but, you know, they're done occasionally. Uh, and then multimodal interventions, well... There are a, a lot of opportunities for this, but one of the things that I think needs to happen a priori is that it's probably going to have to be a focus in changing ICU culture about these patients and, and how we treat them across the board and all services provided. And then, you know, home-based interventions, to me, the, the parallel is really how we transition these patients from the ICU to the ward, from the ward to the community. Um, and these are things that, you know, are potential targets. So... To leave you with a few things, a few thoughts. Frailty is a complex, multi-dimensional syndrome that contributes to uh, vulnerability to adverse events and outcomes. I believe we can measure it in the intensive care unit. Uh, it's associated with a higher risk of adverse events, death, and health services use. It is associated with lower reported quality of life, uh, increased in new disabilities, and functional dependence. And I think, you know, frailty assessment should be something we start thinking about. I think there's a tide that's coming that, you know, we're going to increasingly see this with demographic transition, more complex comorbidities, more complex procedures. Patients need longer to heal. It's in part because they have a frail state to begin with. But I think, you know, using a tool that, that identifies frailty, identifies a vulnerable population, I, I think it probably will better inform how we talk to patients and families about what they can expect with their care in the ICU after the ICU, and whether we use it for resource uh, appropriate re resource utilization is a separate discussion. In terms of frailty as a therapeutic target, I think it's less well defined. I think there's there's lots of opportunity and, and, and ideas that may come about from this, um, but uh, I can't really comment too further on that. So one of my colleagues, a geriatrician, gave me this uh, far side comic, which I love, and I just want you to substitute old age in here for frailty because I don't think you have to be old to be frail. I think, you know, what we found in our study was that of the cohort of patients who are aged 50 to 64, the prevalence of frailty was 28%. 28%, right? So that's pretty striking. So my belief is that, you know, a frail state predisposes you to critical illness to some extent. And there's lots of reasons why younger people may be frail. I'd like to thank uh, the University Hospital Foundation and the Canadian Intensive Care Foundation and CIHR for helping fund this program and, and acknowledge all my investigators and the huge team of coordinators that helped acquire all this data from across the province. And again, I'd like to thank ANZICS for the opportunity to speak to you. Thank you.